And it is my privilege to introduce our speaker today, Dr. Ken Horton, president of Ministry Catalysts, Inc. Ken Horton became a follower of Christ through personal faith at age eight through the influence of his parents who made a relationship with God a consistent, authentic priority. What a great statement right there. Amen for that. His years at Auburn University were pivotal in his spiritual growth as he learned how to rely on God day by day while enjoying his initial experiences in intentional discipleship. During his years as a space surveillance officer in the Air Force, you need to talk with him about that, Ken embraced relational evangelism and became convinced God wanted him to invest his life in vocational Christian ministry. After completing a THM at Dallas Theological Seminary, he met his wife Kathy while working at a church in North Carolina. Ken and Kathy eventually moved to Fort Worth, where they served at McKinney Memorial Bible Church for 27 years. Ken completed a PhD in historical theology and has taught church history and leadership development as an adjunct instructor here at DTS for many years. He was also the chaplain of the TCU football team for 20 years and now serves on the Board of Regents at DTS. In March 2011, Ken completed an intentional transition at McKinney Church, now what is known as Doxology Bible Church, and launched Ministry Catalyst with his brother Ron and their wives. For 10 years, Ken has focused on intentional one-on-one -on -one discipleship with faithful people and investment in ministries in strategic nations like India, Spain, Israel, Turkey, Cuba, Mongolia, and Singapore. Kathy, who is now with the Lord, and Ken, are blessed with a daughter, Anna, married to Brad, a son named Josh, who is married to Catherine, and four delightful grandchildren. It is an honor to have Dr. Ken Horton with us today. Will you please join me in welcoming him? The first thing I'm going to do when I get home today is write a shorter introduction. <laughs> I want to introduce some folks who have gone through our intentional discipleship process called Launching Multipliers. Several of them come, come from Fort Worth. We've got some students here. If you're someone who understands the experience that we are offering people, would you stand up so that we can know that you are here and encourage... These folks will be at the uh, time for lunch afterwards, and you can ask them any questions that you might have about what we'll be talking about this morning. As Mark mentioned, I had 20 years as the chaplain of the TCU football team. And one of the high points of that was the Rose Bowl in 2011. We won that game, completing a season where we were undefeated, and it was quite a celebration. It was the high point for TCU football since the 1930s. But one of the things that was so delightful with me was the relationship that I had with some of those coaches. And one of those coaches was named Tony Tademy. Tony coached the linebackers. As you can imagine, he was intense. He was focused. He was a master teacher. He would explain to the players what they needed to know so they really understood what the other team was going to do before they did it. But he was also a Christian. He and his wife and two preteen sons were a part of our church. And on road trips, when they fed the players, and they fed the players often, we had lots of little snippets of time to talk about what it meant to really enjoy a relationship with God. It was a delight to have that kind of friendship with him and to share that moment with him at that special time. When I read through 2 Timothy, I hear the cadence and the tone of a master coach like Tony Tatamy. Paul has many exhortations for Timothy. He knows he's about to depart the scene at the hand of Nero's executioners, and he wants to make sure that his young protege is ready for all the challenges that lie ahead. 
One of my favorite parts of this letter is at the end, toward the end, in chapter 4, in five verses, actually in just two of those five verses, he gives nine commands. Sounds like a pregame challenge. Verse 2, he says, preach the word. That sounds familiar. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. And then he says, be sober in all things. Endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Paul loved athletics. He talks about it a lot, even in this letter. And he understood that people needed to be motivated. When he says, fulfill your ministry, he's connecting this challenge with a previous challenge that we find in chapter 2. And in chapter 2, we see Paul explaining a priority in the midst of faithful ministry. You see, both Paul and Jesus were faithful to the multitudes. In one-on-one conversations, in small groups, in large groups, they were teaching them so that they could make incremental progress toward maturity. That's a huge part of ministry. That's part of what you're being trained for here at Dallas Seminary. But while they were doing that, Jesus and Paul sustained a focus on preparing multipliers that was a significant part of how God used them in their strategic ministries. These verses give us clarity and perspective as we think about motivation for multiplication. Let me read 2 Timothy 2, 1-7, to the other primary coaching moment in this letter. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. The things you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Suffer hardship with me as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. Also, if anyone competes as an athlete, he does not win the prize unless he competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer ought to be the first to receive his share of the crops. Consider what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. These four commands give clarity and perspective that sustains motivation for multiplication. The first command in this section is found in verse 1. And in this verse, we see that we must consistently embrace grateful dependence on Christ's strength. Christ is our hope. As we heard the duet sing, it's all about Christ. Jesus, the night before he is crucified, tells his disciples, you must abide in me. If you abide in me, you'll bear fruit. You'll be full of joy. These verses tell us that it is that strength that we receive from Christ that allows us to be useful to God in the strategic ministry that focuses on preparing multipliers. It is rooted in our identity in Christ. It reflects the power of the resurrection at work within us. And it is expressed daily as we present ourselves to God as a living sacrifice. It is an intentional dependence upon God. In our conversations, we talk about presenting ourselves to God, releasing control of ourselves to Him, and then responding to what God has prepared for us to do. One of the things I've discovered in my 70 years is that if I'm not intentionally depending on God, I will inevitably depend on myself. What we call default mode. And I also discovered that you can be doing ministry depending on yourself. You can pass a Hebrew course, depending on yourself. It's not much fun, but you can do that. (laughs) You can teach seminary, depending on yourself. And it may be impressive to people. It may even be encouraging to you short term. 
but it will not be pleasing to God. And one of the things I've discovered the hard way is that when I am anxious, angry, or arrogant, stressed about something I can't control, unhappy with people who don't do what I want, and if it happens to go well thinking I really got this figured out now, in any of those situations, that is a clear sign that I am in default mode. And I need to intentionally agree with God about my sin and once again release control of my life so that I can experience the empowerment that I so desperately need. This blessing is rooted in God's grace. We see in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 that it's salvation that we receive by grace, not of works that no one can boast. In the very next verse, Paul says that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus, an instrument of grace that he fashions and shapes for specific ministry that he's prepared for our lives. And he connects his preparation of us and our circumstances with the power of the Holy Spirit living within us so that we get to be a part of the great privilege of participating in God's purpose. Our salvation is all of grace. Our service is all of grace. And one of the distinctive qualities of a person who understands and embraces the beauty of God's grace is they are filled with gratitude. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, if he died for us, we ought to live for him. It's the appropriate, reasonable response to a God who has given us everything. And he's given it to us not in a principle, not in a philosophy, but in a person, Jesus Christ. And it is that personal, intimate relationship with God that allows us to experience the blessing of abiding in Christ that we heard about in our worship today. The joy of this kind of foundation in your life is at the heart of fruitfulness in any kind of ministry. Incremental progress toward maturity in all kinds of settings and especially intentional preparation of multipliers, because it will be your example that will speak loudest when you get really close to somebody and talk about the truths of God's Word. Our joy, as we depend upon Christ, is a pivotal element of fruitful multiplication. Secondly, in verse 2, we discover that we need to intentionally entrust transforming truth to faithful people. He emphasizes that there are things that Timothy's heard that he's heard repeatedly. And in that oral culture, he doesn't need a workbook to remember what they are. And he says, those are the things that you need to teach people who were faithful enough to entrust that sound doctrine to other people. When I began to think through what we wanted to put in our discipleship process, and we ended up with 18 sessions, we could have had 30, we could have had 12, but we had 18, and every one of them has a distinctive connection to the Pauline doctrinal emphases in his letters. I figured if the things Timothy heard were good for faithful people in the first century, it might be good for faithful people in the 21st century. We have the privilege of learning those truths and sharing those truths as we entrust them to people. Uh, This word can mean explain. It can, in other forms, mean invest, which is appropriate context. In the Gospels, it often means something more natural, like, Setting the table for people to eat. And our conversations are setting the table so people can think through and understand and put into practice the sound doctrine that Paul challenges Timothy and Titus to hold fast to. One of the beauties of having gone through this material with scores of people is that every person I've worked with has given me the opportunity to keep learning from their perspective and from their questions and to be faithful to the command to hold fast to sound doctrine. It is stabilizing. It is enriching. It is motivating to see God more and more clearly 
from his word. And then he tells us we need to make sure we have people that are faithful. When I was early in my discipleship process, they called it fat people. That sort of offended me because I struggled with my weight on occasion. What they were saying is faithful, available, teachable. And that's good. That's important. But I think there's two other elements. A person has to not only be faithful and available, but they have to be intentional. They have to see that it's worth the time to spend months with one person if that one person will spend the rest of their time the rest of their life investing in one or two persons because they'll over 30 or 40 years no telling what's going to do God's going to do through all those people that they pour their life into you have to be intentional and then you have to have a heart for what God's doing when you read this passage your heart has to beat a little faster you have to say you know I want to be involved in that I've had people after I've explained some of what we do says you mean somebody would do that for me They have to have a heart for this. And if you do, and you find that kind of person, the privilege of investing in them is one of the greatest joys of life. It starts a ripple effect that you get to see in this life and that you'll get to enjoy forever. We've had the opportunity over the years to see many people take what they've learned and begin to share it in ways we would have never prepared for and expected. One of the ladies in Fort Worth had a connection with Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary. She met a lady from Korea. She discipled that lady. She went back to Korea. She met two ladies from Brazil and she began to work with them. And in this picture, the shorter lady is our friend Marla. One of the ladies is in the picture. The other lady is taking the picture and you have the two husbands. And they are now in Portugal Investing in a life of lifestyle evangelism and intentional discipleship because a lady in Fort Worth had been prepared by Terry Horton to equip them to be an intentional, multi-generational multiplier. Exciting to see what God can do. Verse 3 through 6 tells us that we must wisely Endure the hardship of faithful and focused ministry. He talks about three pictures. These pictures, these concepts describe a path in which we are able to prevail over the hardships that are part of all kinds of ministry. Incremental progress toward maturity is a challenging experience. Intentional preparation of multipliers likewise has its own challenges. And in all kinds of ministry, with all kinds of people, there are distractions, there are disappointments, there are delays, there is discord and conflict. It's easy to become discouraged. And Paul says, if you're going to be useful to God in the midst of the hardships of all kinds of ministry, you need three qualities. You need the relentless obedience of a dedicated soldier. A soldier does what the commander says, even if it's dangerous. Throughout history, foolish commanders have sent their troops into impossible situations. But we have a wise commander, the sovereign of the universe, and he may put us in a situation that's dangerous, maybe even cost us our life but it's never out of foolishness it is out of faithfulness to accomplishing the purpose of God throughout the world where people need a savior Jesus Christ you need the dedication of a soldier with relentless obedience you need the discipline of an athlete Paul liked athletics I don't know if he was an athletic sometimes the people who like it most are not the ones who are quite as good at it But no matter whether he was a good athlete or he just loved it, you hear those athletic metaphors popping up. And it's interesting in the book of Hebrews is it talks about the rules. The writer of Hebrews says, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Now, there are many things that we need to be faithful to. We need to be focused on. 
And Paul gives Timothy a number of those things. But one thing that is absolutely certain, if you're not living by faith, if you're not practicing verse 1, you're going to become discouraged and disheartened and unfruitful in almost any kind of ministry. Because the ministry that God will use is a ministry that is rooted in our dependence on a God who lives in us and is committed to using us, even in the midst of our frailty and difficulty. You need a persistent focus. As I've mentioned, that was one of the things I loved about Coach Tatamy. He would study the film for hour after hour. And if he noticed that one of the guards put their hand down differently when it was going to be a passing play, guess what his linebackers knew? They knew when they were going to pass. And if you know when they're going to pass or run, it makes a difference in how well you play. You see, when we have that kind of persistent focus, God through the Spirit begins to give us insights about how we can be in a position and a posture that God can use us in our relationships with other people. And then you need the diligence of a farmer. I didn't grow up on a farm. When I was about 10 years old, my grandmother had all the cousins down there, and there was a cotton farm across the road. And I heard that you could earn 25 cents a pound. Boy, I knew I could pick cotton. I started dreaming about all the money I was going to make. I got enough for about one Dr. Pepper at the store at the end of the day. And I can assure you, I never went to that cotton field again. Because the one thing that this verse is not saying, is not trying to validate that farmers are hardworking. That's a, hard working, that's a given. What it's emphasizing is that the hardworking farmer gets to enjoy the fruits first. One of the exciting motivations of intentional preparation of multipliers is you don't have to get to heaven before you see the delightful blessing of how God can use another person in surprising ways. What a blessing. What a delight to see that happen in their lives. I often tell people that are in business, professional people, I'll say you don't have to go to seminary to have this much fun. But I'll also say to you as seminary students and alumni, people who've been entrusted with great resources, if you're not enjoying ministry as much as you think you should, perhaps you need to listen to this very significant coaching point from Paul. Because while you're involved in incremental progress toward maturity with lots of people, the privilege of being up close and personal with one person who is seeing their life change as they obey God's word is incredibly motivating. The first person at Dallas Seminary that I discipled was Anderson DeClunis. He is now the academic dean at the seminary in Port-au-Prince. He and Dukins, another guy that I discipled, are down there. Some of you know Dukins. Anderson has two sons. He and his wife are in a dangerous place. Haiti is difficult. It is incredibly dangerous politically, morally, spiritually, economically. But look at his smile. Now, these younger brothers aren't smiling quite so much yet. <laughs> but Anderson knows something they don't know. And that is that being a part of something that can change lives now and that matters forever is life's richest privilege. You and I have the privilege of being involved in something that will not only enlarge our ministry now, but it will enrich our joy forever. You see, the rewards of ministry are ultimately relational. That's true in this life. Seeing what God does in somebody that you've shared time with, wow, that is so sweet. And when we get to heaven, it's not going to be the streets of gold. It's not going to be those huge jewels in the foundation of the wall. It's not going to be that river going through the new Jerusalem. Fruit different every month. I'm not sure how that works. 
Here's my logic. If there's fruit, there's probably ice cream. I'm not sure of that, but I, I think there may be. But no matter what kind of ice cream there is, even the crowns, the tangible crowns that you'll receive, when those 24 elders throw their crowns at the feet of Jesus, it doesn't say we will follow, but even a guy from South Alabama will figure out that's a good idea. And so the crowns are temporary, they're short-term, they're just an opportunity to be a part of a climactic expression of worship that affirms that God gets the glory and the credit, not only of our salvation, but of every dimension of our ministry. And when you and I are in heaven, there's going to be worship beyond our imagination. We often think of millions of people singing, right? And I'm sure there may be some time where that happens. But here's what I think is going to happen. You're going to get with people you've ministered to. Because Paul says to the Thessalonians, you are my joy, my crown, my hope, my glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. And you're going to gather with a few of those folks. Gather with these Haitian brothers. Hear about what God did. I don't know if there'll be Haitian gumbo, but I do know Jesus got fish along the seashore. And we're going to celebrate. And we're going to talk about how God worked. And we're going to be filled with joy because our great God accomplished more than we could ever imagine. And not a single one of us is going to pat the arrow on the back and say, look what you did. Nobody's going to puff their chest out and say, boy, God sure was lucky to have me on the team. The outcome of all of those interactions, intimate, personal, joyful, relational interactions, focused on Christ, because everything is focused on Christ. When we finish that conversation, worship will spontaneously burst forth. That's why heaven's not going to be boring for a nanosecond. That doesn't mean you have to be involved in intentional preparation of multipliers To have that kind of experience, well, I will tell you this. At 70 years old, I've been in lots of different ministry environments. And I've enjoyed almost all of them. But I have done nothing that has been as rewarding and meaningful and motivational as see God work in a life like Andrickson Decalinus. And then finally, verse 7. Consider what I say. Basically, think about this is the command, for the Lord will give you understanding in everything. Paul says, Timothy, do what God tells you to do. Follow the Lord in this. Because here's the truth. Jesus is still selecting multipliers. He had scores of people following him, and he picked 12. He's got millions of people following him, and he chooses the people that are ready To be prepared as a multiplier. I don't ever push a person or pressure a person to be involved in discipleship. In fact, most of the time, I don't ever bring it up. If they ask me how I'm doing, I say, I get to do something that's so fun. And then they're usually a little curious until they find out I'm talking about something that might take six or eight months. And a lot of people say, well, good for you, which means what? I'm not interested. And then we would explain a little bit more and they find out what's really involved and they say, you know, I I think that's too hard. And I say, you're probably right. There was a guy named Steve. I've known him for 25 plus years. Steve's a pilot. He's got a wonderful family. He's been very generous to our ministry. Known Christ for a long time. And when we started our ministry about 10 years ago, Steve asked me, now what are you doing? And I explained it to him. He had just retired because Steve was a gifted man. He was a college coach for a while. He was a banker. He was in a community where he was leading a bank and the people came to him and says, our school has problems. Would you run for the school board president? Then he moved to another town east of Dallas and the group of people came and says, our town has problems. Would you run as the mayor? He was that kind of guy. But Steve says, no, I'm not ready. I don't think this is what I need to do. I said, well, just let me know if it ever changes. And we talked, we visited, we read, we encouraged each other. I never brought it up to him again. And about a year ago, he said, I'm ready to talk now. We just finished the discipleship process. And so he not only now is able to pilot a plane, he's able to be an instructor pilot for a multiplier who's going to be, he's going to begin training 
in January. Isn't that great fun? What we've learned today is this. Launching multipliers. Not just through the way we do it, but in any way where people are able to intentionally and strategically and multi-generationally invest in other people who will do it with other people. However you're doing that, whatever way that is happening in your life, if you live that kind of life, it will enrich your ministry. It will expand your influence. Because you never can tell when you have a guy like Anderson who has trained hundreds of pastors in Haiti to be multipliers. You never know when God's got big plans for somebody. But also, you need to understand that when you make these kinds of investments, it will enrich your worship forever. How can you not be motivated by that kind of privilege? Let's pray. Father, I thank you that that you've given me the opportunity to be involved in this. I thank you for my brother who for years told me I was missing something. Finally, to my great chagrin, I had to admit my older brother was right. And I thank you that together along with scores of other people, we get the privilege of investing in people that you are selecting to be a part of something that will multiply their joy, that will enlarge their impact and enrich worship forever. We commit these friends to you. Allow them to consider what the Lord wants them to do. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.